position as a natural resource specialist. Who here has seen Spotted Lanternfly already? So most of you, okay. So I'll probably go through kind of the backgrounds, like identifying information a little bit more quickly because I feel as it's been in the county now for a little bit of time, I think all of you, it seems like most of you have seen it, but we'll still cover it just so you get that additional detail as well. But we'll keep this casual. If you have any comments, questions, feel free to give me a holler and we can definitely go over it. I do have some information on the little bench in the front by the couch over there, so feel free to take any of that. And you're always welcome to check in with us for a site visit as well. I do have some business cards, which I think I forgot to put out there, so I will throw some there. But sometimes it can be useful to get um, another perspective before you move forward with treatment. So hopefully this presentation will help you feel more comfortable kind of thinking about that integrated pest management process with the spotted lanternfly on your property, because I know it is kind of an expanding concern at this point. So we'll go ahead and get started. This, these are the topics that we're going to go ahead and cover today. The background biology response and kind of those strategies to manage it within your own property. So range, it's generally considered to be native around the China, India, Vietnam region. It was introduced to other countries, including South Korea. So that was one of the first places where they really had to start thinking about these management strategies that would work. And they started to see that damage, particularly on grapevines within South Korea. Mm -hmm. It was first found in the United States and Pennsylvania in 2014. And then the secondary location was in Winchester, Virginia in 2018. So yeah, it really did that mm -hmm. jump. And it first was brought over here. It was. I, I believe it's been like confirmed at this point, but on a rock shipment from China coming over to Pennsylvania, which is kind of, you know, there's plenty of rocks in Pennsylvania, so it's kind of one of those interesting kind of trade situations. But now established in 13 states and counting, that is an older number, it probably is a little bit higher at this point. I gave this presentation last year, I updated the maps, but not that number. So I think it's closer to about 16 states, but it's, it's still on the East Coast and slightly into the Midwest, as we'll see. In another map in a second. So this this is kind of a nice close-up picture of that early mint stage. I was talking to one of you all earlier about this was one of the first stages that you saw. It does look very similar to a tick mint stage where it does have kind of the six legs. It can blend into vegetation, but once you kind of see it, you, you can kind of distinguish it from a lot of other insect insects. It's pretty distinct. And that's the adult here, which will co cover some look-alikes as well. So this is the current distribution. So yeah, mostly still around. You can see the definite range kind of close to Pennsylvania. There are some populations that are kind of leapfrogging around, kind of skipping over some other counties and states. And we'll talk about the reasons why that's happening in a little bit. But that is what the current <coughs> state is with the United States right now, where spotted lantern flood distribution is. The areas that are in red are quarantine areas. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So in Virginia, this is a current map right now. So we were kind of an outlier population here in Prince William County, started kind of in Winchester right around this area. And so it is spreading rapidly. There's a lot of efforts right now to help to control that spread. And that's one of the most important things that you all can do, knowing that we're in a quarantine county now. It is throughout most of Prince William County at this point. So if you're going taking a trip, you know, across the country, taking an RV or something like that, you want to make sure that you're checking everything so you're not, particularly the egg mass stage, that's very easy for the adults to lay their eggs on pretty much anything. They'll lay it on light bulbs, they'll lay it on mm -hmm. tires. They really don't have a preference if it's tires too. Yeah, it's slightly protected, kind of very similar to Gypsy Moth, which has also been around our, our county for a while. They'll look for a slightly sheltered location, and particularly if it's close to their preferred kind of tree host, they'll definitely go ahead and lay their eggs on just about anything. So that's one of the best things that you can do as residents to help prevent the spread further across the country. Well, quarantine simply means you check vehicles before you go out of the area. Right, so great question. So quarantine, it, it can depend on what area you're looking at right now, each individual state has a particular quarantine. So there is a Virginia state quarantine that is administered through Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. So they're the ones that are responsible for enforcing that quarantine. So businesses have to inspect the materials and have to be putting 
kind of a certificate of inspection on any shipments kind of leaving mm -hmm. their area going outside. So it really restricts businesses. But as kind of individual residents within Prince William County, you should be checking everything before you leave. Does everyone do that all the time? Then mm -hmm. no, because it does become a little bit of a hassle to do that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you're really helping the overall mission by preventing that spread by doing kind of just a simple check. And we'll talk a little bit more about areas to check as well. But just remember, any slightly sheltered location, they are very happy to go for. I mean, ideally, you know, checking your whole vehicle before you leave quarantined area so you can see where it is. So say you're heading back to the southeastern part of Virginia, you know, you're, you know, you're leaving a quarantine area and heading somewhere else. Just doing a quick check to, for those egg masses, especially around this time, is super helpful. The adults and nymphs too can be stowaways. When we were taking some photos with the um, Prince William County uh, Communications Department, they had their kind of bags for the cameras all laid out on the ground, and nymphs were very happily crawling into those bags. Oh, so, yeah. you know, that's. Oh, boy. But oh. the good oh, news the is that. Right, the exactly. Oh, they were in the grass. I mean, they were, you know, crawling up the trees and eating the vegetation around the grass, and they were just, wow. you know, they hop at all of those life stages. So they're very. They're able to just be transported very, very easily. So definitely check things that you don't anticipate. Even doing something like rolling up your windows if you're around an area can help. So I wouldn't leave your car windows down, you know, especially if you have a lampus trees on or near your property. So that's that well, separate. Right. Right. How long is it taking to lay an egg mask? I mean, is it minutes, hours? Or that, that's a good question. I think it's more like maybe between like 10 to 30 minutes would be my very approximate get, guess. I've watched them kind of lay some of their so egg So you masks. could like drive into a, an area, park, go shopping, come out and have egg masses on your car. It's possible. Yeah, it's possible. So <coughs> you can see wow. the, the limitations of trying to manage the spread. Yeah. So super, super difficult, particularly with insects <coughs> like this. So yeah. But one good good news is I was reading something, I think it was on Cornell, where they have identified they must feed within 48 hours or they'll die. So they do need that constant sugar intake in order to survive. So if they're in an area like say, you did have some materials that you had on the on the floor and you're worried about, you know, maybe you missed seeing them get in there. If you just kind of keep it in a room for a couple of days, they should be dead because they won't have anything to eat. So that is kind of good news in terms of thinking about managing that spread a little bit. You have a question over here. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. How big are they? So the nymphs are extremely small, okay. and then the adults are about this big. And about I have a couple of inches. It, yeah, they're about like maybe an inch and a half. Their their size will vary, you know, depending on their sure. food source, etc. But yeah, the nymphs are very, very tiny when they first hatch okay. out, and yeah, the adults will be about that big. And I do have some good kind of brochures there that kind of go over the. And so this is what our population is looking currently in Prince William County. So this is a heat map. So it was first found right about here around um, the Manassas Regional Airport. So around that kind of corridor. And that's also where the train lines run. So mm -hmm. there, you know, we can't definitively <coughs> know how it was introduced, mm -hmm. but likely that is probably the possible yeah. cause. And since then it has spread, you know, pretty much throughout. Because, you know, this is Prince William Forest Park down here, it probably in the Marine oh Corps base, it probably has spread more there. We just haven't mm -hmm. seen it. But you're not really gonna see it in mature forest either, because that's not really its habitat. What it's about very, uh, surrounding counties off here in Loudoun? I'm I'm in Marshall, so is it is it just as bad or worse or so Marshall, Marshall County is close to Fauquier. Oh no, it's, it's, it's a town. Oh, okay. So Fauquier is over here. So yes, they are present, but it's not quarantined yet. We're just a few miles away okay. from Yeah, there. just a few miles. Okay. In, yeah. So le very likely you will go under quarantine if there's enough of a population there. That's a decision that the Virginia Department of Ag makes. So very likely you will be under quarantine. So you do want to be checking your materials and just making sure. Yeah, when, when you are under quarantine, mm -hmm. Are we now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what do you have to be doing? Just we're not checking out of it yet. Yeah, but we're right in the middle. So if you're here in Prince William County, you are under quarantine. And so yeah, just basically checking to make sure that you're not transporting any of those life oh, okay. stages. So okay. that's as a resident. Look up. Exactly. If you're a business, you have to go through kind of a more complex procedure a little bit. They're not trying to make it too complicated. So, you know, it's not taking too much time on the part of businesses. But as a resident, yeah, just double checking any material that you're taking, you know, if you're planning like a summer vacation or something like that, you're transporting a bunch of especially outdoor material somewhere else or a vehicle somewhere else. Just doing a quick check is super helpful just to make sure you're not transporting it.
There are. And so, yeah, Piper Lane, yeah, right by the airport, so that's where it was first found. And so, around the Piper Lane area, because it's kind of a delicate resource protection area and kind of the wetland, there's beautiful bluebells down there, if any of you have been down there in the spring. What they were trying to do, because they couldn't do the treatments, the contact treatments they did at other sites, they were trying to control, manage the population by putting traps out, which unfortunately did not to quite to the level they wanted it to. So uh, the Prince William County also helped out with that effort. So unfortunately, it wasn't quite as effective as we were hoping. So I, I believe Prince William County is continuing to maintain those tracks along Piper, but Virginia Department of Ag is no longer working with the veterans. You're not maintaining the tracks along there? Uh, Prince William County should be. I believe they've, they've taken it over. And this is what the, the traps that Jimmy's talking about. So this is a circle <coughs> trap. This is what we are recommending to use if you want to do trapping on your property. The sticky band traps, avoid them. Because mm -hmm. even if you put this stuff over top of them, unfortunately, you're still getting a lot of bycatch. So some of those skinks crawling up, we've seen yeah. snakes on them very sadly. So you know we tried to do kind of both and kind of testing it out, including like putting the mesh over top of it to avoid any, we never saw any birds, thankfully. <laughs> But it's still, it's so sad to see those other amphibian yeah. reptile guys being mm -hmm. caught. So I, yeah. avoid the sticky yeah. traps. It's not worth the yeah. wildlife impact. Mm -hmm. You can still get some things getting in that bag. We found a mouse in there one time, <laughs> oh, which thankfully we're able to release. And so he was, he was fine. Mm -hmm. But you need to be checking these regularly. So I would recommend twice yeah, a week if you can, that. once a week at bare minimum. Otherwise, it could be getting some other stuff in there. Frogs, we've seen trapped in there. You know, generally, we can we can get them out. But the hole has to be big enough. So we were talking about the size. The hole has to be big enough for other things to get through. So and you will get a lot of other insects as well, not just spotted lanternflies. They're continuing to experiment with lures that will kind of attract them more than other insects, but they're still working on that. They don't with, have with the what was that? Lures. lures. So yeah, so like there's different like pheromones and chemicals that attract them. So they're still kind of trying to figure that out. It's too bad the birds don't like them. They have few predators, right? But they do. So the birds do like them, and there's a lot of research trying to figure out, you know, what best biological control, what animals we can rely on to help control them. So not all birds, some birds are helping yeah. us out. And so they're still yeah. doing a lot of research. There's great organizations that you can contribute your observations to. So if you do mm -hmm. see any birds going after them, yeah, let them know, mm -hmm. take a picture if you can. Mm -hmm. But there's a few groups on iNaturalist, if you guys are familiar with that, yeah. that are trying to keep an eye on what other predators are going after them. So there is promising news that, you know, it is picking up, but unfortunately with biological control, it never brings the population down mm -hmm. to a crash completely, usually. So in, in this case, it probably will be that, where it's gonna mm -hmm. manage the population a bit, but not completely eliminate it. Right. Do, the birds, do they die, do the lanternflies die in that trap, or when you go empty them, are they still alive? Excellent question. It depends. They're still alive a lot of times, and so they're just all like clumped together and being really, yeah, kind of gross because you get a lot of other insects in there, especially if they get wet. Sometimes water will get in the traps, and that is incredibly disgusting. So I try, <laughs> try to avoid doing that. You can kind of tie this part up towards the tree a little bit, and that helps to keep it upright so it's not collecting water, but some of them will be dead, some of them will still be living, so what you can do is tie the bag closed and freeze it, or you can smash them depending on your preference for growth factor. Yeah, yeah, so you, you do ideally want to kill them rather than just releasing them back, back out, if you, especially if you're using this for management on your property, where you're just trying to control the number that are present, or if you have like a favorite tree and you're trying to make, because they typically, and the reason why this trap works is because they crawl up and down the tree. They will fall out of the tree sometimes and then crawl back up. So this trap will work a little bit better for the larger instars, the larger immature stage, and then the adults, but it, it will still catch some of the smaller nymphs as well. But sometimes they'll just kind of go over and continue up. So it's not gonna catch all the trees that are going up, I mean, excuse me, all the insects going up the tree, but they will catch some of them. But yeah, you definitely do need to kill them after they go into the bag. There are some pesticides used sometimes that you can put inside the bag and that will kill them right away. But if you want to minimize your pesticide use, you can just smash them or freeze them and that just does the same thing. Mm -hmm. That also will allow you to take any good guys out of there that you catch without killing them. So that would be my recommendation unless you're squeamish about dealing with the insects. Do you put just one trap on a tree? 
Or do you need to have one on, on like both sides? Depends on the size of the tree. So it, oh. if it is kind of a larger diameter, you probably do yeah. want to do two traps or kind of find a way to extend that mesh because you do want them because they kind of crawl up and then they kind of keep on going up towards the top like that. So if it is a larger tree, then usually we would do two traps if gotcha. we needed to on each side. <coughs> do we have to make them or can we? Uh, you, you can purchase them. They, um, Penn State does have a very good guide up to make it yourself, and it's a pretty easy process, but you still can buy them. I forget the company of it, but if you look up Circle Traps by the Lanternfly, you should have one or two options. That would be a good local workshop for people to get yeah. together and build their own right. traps. Yeah. Because, yeah, especially when we have so many trees, right. I would need so many traps. Yeah. yeah, and we did that over at least Sylvania State Park a few times, but I don't think we ever did it over on this side of the county. But that's something that you all are interested in. Yeah, we could mm -hmm. definitely kind of work with partners and have a craft building cool. workshop, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. And so damage. So one thing that's really important to emphasize is this is not a tree killing insect. So a lot of kind of the early concern was they, they, don't, they didn't know how much damage this insect would end up causing. But at this point, it's definitely confirmed as a tree stressor. There's been recent research out of Penn State that seems to indicate it's not actually affecting trees as much as they originally thought. Oh. Kind of the diameter is still being affected in terms of how much woody growth the tree is putting on for some species. But kind of early research is starting to indicate it's not the super damaging insect that was originally feared. But we didn't know. When it first came over, you know, we were like, we wanted to be cautious and that's usually the approach that's taken when one of these new species is introduced. But it's still great, it still is devastating just because it has all that sugar, it has a good flow. And so that's still the biggest concern right now is within the grape industry. So that's still something that uh, grape growers have to be on the lookout for. They definitely need a lot of management to protect their vines. What do you mean by that? I have grapevines now. So, so you're going to have to be protecting your, your grapevines to make sure they're not, in, and we'll get into management a little okay. bit more. But, <clears throat> so yeah, definitely if you're growing grapes as commercially or within the home kind of landscape, yeah, you, you do want to be on the lookout and have some management in place. So on a residential level, the honeydew and sooty mold, this is the sooty mold down here, so this is a kind of different fungi that are growing on the honeydew that spotted lanternfly excretes as they feed. So definitely from kind of the nuisance. Tasty. Exactly right. <laughs> and this is kind of what it looks like. So they are kind of going into the phloem tissues, slurping all the sugary substance up, but they can't process all of it. So whatever they can't process is being excreted out. It will attract things like wasps, bees, mm -hmm. And they actually sell honey that's made from, you know, spotted lanternfly honeydew. I think it's death bloom honey. So, oh, wow. yeah, so you can buy that online if anyone's interested. <laughs> so you can't get it anymore, and you kind of are supporting, you know, pollinators to some degree by letting spotted lanternfly feed to some degree, maybe. But it can be kind of a nuisance issue, especially if it's by kind of parts of the yard that you tend to frequent a lot, and then the kind of sooty mold that grows on where the honeydew has been sticking to, it can limit photosynthesis of other understory species. So that can be a concern as well, as well as just kind of, it's a little bit unsightly. You can definitely spray it off, but it takes some time. When you get a lot of adults feeding, like around the Piper Lane area, it just, it looks black. It looks like it's been burnt. So it is not a very attractive appearance. I'm curious about that honey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, check it out. No, they, they if sell it. doing that, it seems right. like they would be encouraging the spotted lantern to hang around. I mean, and that's exacerbating the problem. Right. Well, that's a legitimate deal, is it? I mean, the, in Pennsylvania, the populations have been so high because they've been there so long. We're never going to completely eradicate it at this point unless there's a super tiny population that you know, people see right away. And then they do a lot of pesticide treatments within a certain radius and really kind of hone in on where that population is and kind of take it down. So in some areas, it seems like they've done it, kind of going back to that map really fast. It's like some of these isolated areas, you know, have been this way for a couple of years or maybe only another county or two. It could be for lack of resources for people looking, or it could be that they found that one tiny population that popped up. So I mean, that's the ideal situation that you find that small population and that's what we were originally hoping when it first came to Prince William County, but that wasn't the case. It had already kind of started to spread around. 
But yeah, it's, at some point it's just you're never going to control them all. So I don't know that they're necessarily encouraging them, they're just kind of making use of what the situation is. So some silver lining in the storm clouds. So we do have other sap feeders. You guys probably recognize quite a few of these. Some plant hoppers, leaf hoppers, two lines to the bugs. Stink bugs. Stink bugs. They have been a problem. Yes, yes. They have been a big have problem. Been they come back like, every year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we all have. Yeah, the brown marmorated stink bug, that was kind of another invasive insect that people were really concerned about. It still does c cause problems depending on the area, but it's, it's a nuisance. Yes, it yeah. is a nuisance. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we do have other native and non-native sap feeders, and some of them are able to transmit diseases between different plants. So far, there was some concern that spotted lanternfly may be capable of doing that, but based on the research I've seen, they have not proven that yet, but it's something that they'll continue to keep an eye on because other plant hoppers are able to do that, such as um, bacterial leaf scorch. So biology a little bit, we've talked about this a little bit already, but it is a plant hopper, it's not a fly, not a moth, it is a plant hopper within the order Hemiptera. They are very excellent jumpers in all life stages. So as adults, they can't really fly super well, but they do kind of flutter weakly and glide, and they are incredible hoppers. I don't know how many that you guys have tried to kind of catch, potentially since most of you have seen them, but you get up close to them, they will spring away. Oh. Someone was telling me, Marie, when we were out um, doing, going around Leopold's Preserve, that they can only hop a couple of times and they get kind of worn down. They seemingly were kind of doing that, but I think that's kind of anecdotal at this point. I'm not sure if that's scientifically proven, but so if you chase them a little bit, you know, it might help them to calm down. We're trying. But they will shelter the base of plants during the day or after falling because they'll kind of crawl up and then fall back down to the ground again. So you can find them around those areas and they will proceed back up the tree to feed, especially at night, you know, when predation is a little bit less from birds and, and other things they may be concerned about. They do tend to aggregate together, especially as the older nymphs and adults. So if you have a high population, you generally will see a big clump of them kind of feeding all at once. So that can be useful for identifying. They are easily disturbed, so they will do that kind of hopping mechanism to get away. It's important to note they cannot bite their sting. So from kind of a human health standpoint, they will not do anything that is going to harm you unless you know you were very worried about this having bug contact, which some people are, that's okay. And I think there was a concern about pets eating too many. So if you do have a lot in your yard, that could be another reason to do some management potentially to kind of avoid that process. So preferred host plants, they have a very wide host range, but when they get a little bit older, it starts to narrow down a little bit. So when they're young, they'll feed on pretty much, I'm gonna skip to that slide for a second. They'll feed on pretty much anything. You guys might have more to add to this list. I've seen them often on multi-flora roads when they're really young. So that's kind of a good place to check as well as Virginia creeper, poison ivy, uh, blackberries, raspberries, but there's probably a lot of other ornamental plants that aren't necessarily on this list. So this is probably a, just a small snapshot of what they're going to feed. And sometimes they'll kind of test something out, they'll like taste it, they'll put their silent in and kind of be like, mm -hmm. do I like this or not? And then, <laughs> you know, they'll move on to something that's more preferred. So that you might see them feed for just a little bit and they'll kind of skip to something else. So just something to keep in mind. But their prolonged feeding habits, especially when they get older, they really like oriental bittersweet, another invasive. They really like um, grapevines, so that includes our native grapes as well, not just our grapes that we grow. <coughs> they really like black walnut, so that's another really preferred food source for them, as well as maples. So after Alanthus kind of starts, they lose their leaves a little bit earlier than other trees, so you guys might have noticed that, and they will skip over to maple kind of later on in the season. That, based on some conferences I attended, Red and silver maples are one of their favorite, most favorite food many, sources. <clears throat> many silver maples. Do you, okay. Yep. And tu tulip trees, tulip yes, poplars, that, many. That is other and well. black yeah. walnuts, many. Mm, okay. And uh, unfortunately, many on as well. Mm. They snuck in. Yeah. And on this side of the county, that's a lot of the trees that you all have. Mm -hmm. You definitely have the oaks as well, but you do have a lot of the black walnuts yeah. and maples yeah. and kind of that sort of old side. Doesn't like oak. Doesn't like oak. So I, I mean, I think they'll, they'll feed a little bit on it. That's good news for oaks. There's yeah, so right. much that, you know, goes after Something them. Something good for oaks. <laughs> exactly. It's so rare that we see that, right? But, but there's a lot of things that do like oak leaves, I think. 
Right yes, oh, yeah. So for those of you that are familiar with Dr. Talamy, oaks are one of our best host yeah. sources to support, you know, other insects. Mm -hmm. So the, they're great to have around. It's very great that spotted butterfly does not like them. Yeah. So. But Tree of Heaven, Olympus is their ultimate preferred food source. It was originally thought that they needed this species in order to uh, develop and survive, but that has been refuted. They do grow and develop better when they have it around, but they are able to develop on, a, on other plant species without it. So if you get rid of Olympus on your property, you're not going to get rid of your spotted butterfly mm -hmm. population. Mm -hmm. So it's unfortunate, but by managing, you know, Olympus, you are reducing an invasive species. So there, there is some benefit to control, but unfortunately it's not going to eliminate spotted butterfly from your property. So for those of you who may not be familiar with Olympus, it is a pretty distinct tree. Usually I call this a cantaloupe rind is what it looks like. I've heard that descriptor before, so that seems pretty accurate in terms of the bark. It can get really kind of flaky, almost like white oak bark. There's a really beautiful specimen down in Fredericksburg at the little park along the water. If any of you ever go down there, that has this nice kind of flaky bark. Can I ask you a question? Of course. Um, this tree is really invasive. Yes. Um, right. And I've seen it in between the roads on 66, mm -hmm. mostly mm -hmm. after you get out of Prince William County. Mm -hmm. To get yeah. up here. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, is there anything the state is doing to eradicate the tree itself? That's a good question. I think there are places that they're trying to do that because it grows so quickly. I mean, even if they do some eradication measures, you know, it might still pop back keep up. Coming back. Exactly. Yeah. It. The Virginia Native Plant Society has been advocating for years to have the state declare Ilanthus and the, the Bradford or Calorie Pear and other trees that are still for sale in nurseries to have them taken off the market, but they're not doing it because the nursery owners make money off them. Mm -hmm. They're fast growing mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. developers love them. Right. Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen a little bit of reduction, I think, in Bradford Care, oh, at least here. Yeah. I don't know yeah. about other counties, but it definitely seems to be planted less here. Definitely those older neighborhoods, like where I live back in Montclair. The word is getting out. out. Yes, yeah, <laughs> at least here in Falk here. Well, yeah. there in Falk here. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you drive south, uh, you, you'll see field after field of nothing but Bradford Fair. Yeah. 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 People yeah. like them to, draw, to line their driveways. Right. Because yeah. they are a very ornamental pretty tree. Right. But yeah, they're horrible they, they're 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 trees. Sound, they <coughs> just start breaking apart. <coughs> There's my yeah. yeah. neighbor down the road with Wilson. Right. She has a long driveway. Yeah. Like Bradford I'm aware of that. Yeah. I mean, it, it's awesome that the Virginia Native Plant Society is doing all the work that they are and try to slowly make that change. So that's that's good news they're doing that. But yeah i mean so the state's just saying that it's it's too big a job we're not going to do it i believe they are doing some and i, I do want to give credit to the state agencies definitely virginia department of forestry has been a leader in trying to encourage management um virginia department of transportation i don't think it's a priority of theirs i, I think that's fair to say but they definitely do have a lot of crews that are certified pesticide applicators and right ways that do some there. some management mm -hmm. of it it's just, you know, they have so much to do, so little budget, but, you know, you all are very, very great advocates. You can go to them and be like, you know, hey, we're seeing this. We think it's a concern. What are you doing? That's a perfectly legitimate way of kind of bringing it up and kind of seeing if some change can be made. But I know our job to get rid of it. Yeah. Um, well, actually, it isn't, but you have to be certified to use the chemical. You do. You do have to be a pest certified pesticide applicator. You ideally should be an arborist or at least know, be able to differentiate between, you know, sumac, walnut, and Atlantis, which can be hard to do if you don't have that background knowledge. So you, you do have to have a little bit of tree ID skills in order to do it. Up in Pennsylvania, they went really hardcore and they were taking out all of the female trees. So they couldn't continue to spread by seed because if, if you all are familiar with them, they make copious right. amounts of seeds. Yeah. They get everywhere. And they'll also spread by suffering. So that's why the pesticide piece is mm -hmm. so important to management. Virginia Department of Forestry has a really great guide to managing Tree of Heaven. So if you all haven't seen that yet, I encourage you to check that out. Kind of a maybe 10 page document or so, and it goes over kind of step by step what you need to do to, to manage it. Where so. is that? Sorry. 
Uh, look up a Virginia Department of Forestry, put in Tree of Heaven Management, and that should take you right to it. And then you got to go hire somebody to do it. I read yes. it, it was staggering how much work it was. So we just it's a lot. cut one down, yeah. dug it up, yeah. tried to burn it. It doesn't burn well at all. <laughs> well, yes. well, I was with you and yeah. a couple other people when we were out at Bristow Battlefield, yeah. and they were doing an eradication, and she, the lady in art, what's her name? Uh, Julie Flanagan. Julie Flanagan. Oh, yeah. And she She's was good. doing, she was coming back because there were some they had missed. The ones she had treated were dead, but the ones that she came after were ones that she just didn't notice. And what they did was they took a, are you going to talk about this too? But um, they take an ax and they score right. just a, like at chest level, and then she sprayed this applicant on there. She says, this will be dead in two weeks. And so it, it definitely and it, works. Yeah, and it takes care of all those suckers that are a part of that root system. So yeah, you either have to do that chemical treatment, or you have to get out there year after year and just continue to cut them down. I right. mean, you can do it that way, but it's going to be a long process yeah, you to, to get them all. They can sucker, you know, how long tree root systems go. It can go up to six times the width of the canopy. So I mean, they go pretty long. But to give Leopold's Preserve credit, they also did the same thing where they actually discovered another really good technique where they drilled a hole and then they poured the chemical in there and that worked very well for them. That's what our guy did. Okay. Got rid of all of them. And, That's awesome. And the Russian olives. Yeah. And, uh, That's great. Yeah, they're, they're, they're so well. Did you get a tree of heaven too at one point? Then you got a little skeleton of a tree there. It's true, but it still serves its wildlife habitat. You can still yeah. get the woodpeckers yeah. moving yeah. in. Which and like it's a neighborhood yeah. menace. You have to. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, there's, so there's, it's, it's a process, but I mean, the, if you see Tree of Heaven somewhere and you're like, hey, why aren't you managing that? Yeah, give, give them a heads up. You know, if you want to see BDOT doing it. Done. Yeah, <laughs> at, at the, you know, I, I think they are doing it to some degree, but again, it's just they have so much they have to do and they have to keep I bought my house without even knowing it had Atlantis. I had no yeah. idea. I didn't yeah. know what it was. And, and I have some it beautiful is. specimens. Yes. They're, they're 70 feet tall. They're yeah. huge. And I'd say if you have male Atlantis and you like them and they're serving as wildlife habitat, which which they do. I mean, it's a right. nice structural tree. I'm sure birds. Well, they're very ornamental, and, and yeah. I have so they're many right next to your house, and they'll come down on top of it. Well, I have one in the circular driveway right in the middle, and yeah. it's beautiful. And yeah. if I would take them all down, it would really be detrimental to the, to the appearance of the property. So your advice, I'd keep the male trees. Anything that gets the seeds, it's worth removing that just to reduce the spread. But yeah, if you have pretty mature trees, keep in mind they are weaker wooded than you know oaks or hickories, so yeah. they are more likely to break. So if it is a little bit away from things, yeah, and you like them, it's, you know. But it's, they, they seem to do well with the native hardwoods. I have, I have several poplars, tulip poplars, yeah. and I have several wild red buds. And, and dogwoods. Okay, so and, you, have uh, a, you have a good mix. Of and and black walnuts. Like, yeah. And um, um, so, so they all, you know, they don't seem to be harming the other trees. Oh, what time of the year it, can you see the pods on the females? When do you identify it? About fall, like early fall is when you can see them. They're long. See, yeah, they're very long. And, and they've got like big. a pink cluster. Mm. And I think yeah. I, we, I brought something that identifies them, which, oh, okay. And so these are the seed pods here. Oh yeah. That. oh yeah. But on some trees, you know, they make a really large quantity and then the leaves will start to fall off and you can see the seed pods kind of hanging through the winter until they start to disperse. So yeah, I mean, I'd say try to get rid of the female trees if you can, just from an invasive species standpoint. They are allelopathic, so just one word of caution, they can reduce the growth in other species, but it sounds like your other trees are doing okay thus far. They're doing so. fine, and I have about two dozen islanthus. Can no, you imagine okay. the cost involved to get them It'd all cut down? It would be a lot, it would be a lot. Yeah. Because they're huge. Right. And <coughs> so I've been very diligent, diligent looking for the spotted lantern fly and okay. their egg masses. I have not seen any. Well, that's good news. But, but it's a matter of time, I guess, right. eventually they'll come. Right. You know where to look. So. Yeah. Yeah. So that's we need to see I'm exactly gonna... what the egg masses look like. Okay. So we, well. we, will we will make sure that we cover that too. No, you're good. So life cycle. So one generation per year, there is some recent evidence that they can kind of last through colder months if they can find a sheltered location, but I think that's kind of more cutting edge a little bit when we're still looking into that. But generally, it's one generation per year in our area. It does last through the winter and the egg stage. Nymphs emerge around April or so, kind of depending on how many warmer days that we've had. It is very beautiful, though. 
There's four immature stages. Eggs are laid after a few months of heavy, heavy feeding in early late to late fall, and then adults die after a significant frost. They should be dead now. And so I, I heard from a few of you who've seen dead spotted lanternflies, so I, I wouldn't anticipate finding any live ones unless they really found a nice sheltered location to hide out. That's what all those um, life stages look like. We'll get a better photo of the egg masses, but this is kind of what they look like is a smear of mud or putty. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the eggs can be uncovered to where it looks like a little row of kind of like black rice almost. Mm -hmm. So you can see that as well, or they can be partially covered. If they're older, they're gonna be a little bit more cracked and weathered looking. So they will only last through the winter into the spring and then they should hatch out. But sometimes like any other insect, some of the eggs will hatch. So you might still see part of the egg mass there and it can last a few seasons after it's hatched. When it does, when they do hatch out, you'll see kind of what they call like a little trap door opening and then the nymphs will escape through that. So that's one way to tell if it is hatched yet or not. You'll see a bunch of little holes and if it's still there, kind of a little piece of the egg mass that's lifted up. So there's that kind of first through a third instar is black with the white spots. This is the fourth instar, so right before they turn into the adults, they tend to stand out really well against vegetation. So this, both of these life stages are good ones to take a look for. If you're just scouting your property, you want to mm -hmm. see if you have them or not, I'd recommend doing it around kind of the June, June to August time frame. You should be able to see these two life stages. These guys can be hard to see unless you're really kind of going and gardening and kind of taking a close look mm -hmm. at your vegetation. So the adults are pretty distinct. We don't really have a lot that looks <coughs> super similar. If you kind of catch movement out of the corner of your eye, you could mistake it for leopard moth especially, it looks pretty similar. Ornate bella moth, I, don't, I haven't seen too many of these. I'm not sure how prominent they are in this area or not. Some of you other insect lovers might be able to correct me on that, but I don't think this is one we commonly see. We do see this guy pretty frequently. We do see buck moth sometimes these other two guys, but these to me are pretty distinct. You will only see this red kind of underwing when it has its wings splayed open. So some usually you'll just see it like this, where the wings are kind of closed, so it does tend to blend in, especially on a gray type tree like a lampus. They're really pretty. They are, yeah, they're gorgeous. Yeah, they're so pretty. And so there, I mean, there are some people that feel like we should just be letting them do their thing, especially as you know, they're not causing the amount of devastation that we originally thought, but definitely controlling the spread is one of the most important things that you can do because every new county they get to that's more pesticides that are gonna be applied, that's right. more concern that there's going to be for grapes and other crops, they will go after fruit trees as well. So there's something to consider. I mean, if you see them, it's nice to splash them, to report them, but you don't have to run after each spot of letter fly you see. So that is an important, important concept to hopefully kind of take away from this. We're not at an eradication point anymore. We're kind of at a management, let's do what we can mm -hmm. to live through them and to reduce their spread. I have a question about the yes. parents. Um, I thought when earlier this year we were at another place and they were showing pictures of them having kind of a green sheen, mm -hmm. iridescent green. Was it, um, was that something else? Was it emerald ash borer, maybe? The uh, iridescent green sheen? <coughs> well, maybe that's not the it's, it's a, So it's a similar, sometimes these two get compared because that was another recent invasive insect introduction oh, okay. to the area, and they go after ash trees. So the adult beetle, unfortunately, I don't think I have a photo in this slideshow, but the adult beetle is kind of green with that really pretty iridescent yeah, they sheen. They are. They're yeah, they're another really like gorgeous jewelry. insect. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, they're, they're very pretty, well, pretty I, beetles. I, I thought an insect thought was this. Mm -hmm. It was in the grass, just lying there. And what caught my eye was the iridescent green of the wing. So I stomped it, thinking I was getting rid of the lantern fly. <laughs> oh. But, um, well, it's equally invasive, yeah. so. Still it might have been a six-spotted um, tiger beetle, which is also iridescent green. They tend to be uh -huh. on the forest floor and that kind of within the grass. That might have been what you saw. And if you, I mean, it, no, it's, mm -hmm. it's a shame to kill an insect, but you're doing it in good faith. Yeah. So. <laughs> it was the only one I saw I in our yard. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah that's, that, sometimes if you just you know, see a little bit, you know, scurrying movement, it can be challenging to see what you see. But the emerald ash borer, just a very quick aside, <coughs> 
It has moved through the county, moved through the area. There are some ash trees left. You can still see the beetles, though, because there's enough ash trees to support a small population. So it is possible that you might see them have as well. So we had a question about the eggs. This is what they look like super close up. So you can see that these are a little bit older because you can see kind of the, the cracked look, but they're still fresh because we're not seeing the holes of the emerged nymphs yet. And we'll see those now and through the winter. Yes, so we'll be seeing the egg masses now through the winter. I mean, they will continue to last. They'll start to get weathered away and kind of look a little bit um, uh, less intact. But one way to tell if you're dealing with an egg mass or not, because they can look like lichens, they can look like growths on the tree bark, is just to put your finger against it. You can see my little fingerprint there, and that can tell if you're dealing with an egg mass or not, if you're ever It'll not sure. Print. Yes. Because I have so much lichen, lichen yeah. you know, growing on my tree trunks. Every tree trunk is lichen, and yeah. so it's easy to miss it, but I Definitely. can still really look in, and I don't quite have seen anything. So if we put our, if we scratch it with our fingernail, it'll, it'll leave a mark. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So yeah, you'd be able to scratch a little bit off and it will leave that finger imprint if you okay. put it on there. And definitely look at the kind of the branches kind of growing uh, more laterally. You can see a lot of them on the, the undersides of the branches too. It's another uh, good place to look. But the majority of the egg masses will be in the upper portion of the tree. So you can try to scrape them off. And that is one th thing that they recommend. Definitely scrape them off of vehicles or those items that you're moving. But on the tree itself, unfortunately, scraping them off is not going to reduce the population that much. So last one are so high, we won't see it. Exactly. So Unless you get a pair of binoculars and we've done this, right. you can't spot them, but it does take some well, effort. Will they also be in the bus toward the bottom where we can reach them? So about 10% is what is estimated. Oh, so so, wow. you're, so with your mature Olympus right. trees, yeah, probably a lot of them would be in the upper. But branches. I haven't seen the, the flies. I haven't seen them at all. Okay, I'm not sure. Well, even through the summer, when I because I'm outside okay. every day yeah. gardening. You probably would have noticed them, especially yeah. if you were out kind of in, in the yard. Almost every that. day I'm out there and yeah. I haven't seen anything. Okay, yeah, just keep an eye on. I would recommend that June to like August time frame right. to kind of look for the mints and okay. the adults. Susie, did you have a question? No. Okay. And once you scrape them, how do you kill them? So scraping them, if you take like a credit card or old gift card, scrape them off into like a double Ziploc baggie, put some old hand sanitizer in there, rubbing alcohol, kind of inundate them, close the baggie up, throw it away. That's the best way to do it. Because that sometimes if you kind of scrape them off and just kind of stomp on them, you could miss some egg masses and still get some hatch. Because that's the most foolproof way to make sure you're not getting some more coming up. Now these masses are only about an inch or so. Yes, yeah, for, for those of yeah, you who have lived in the area for a while, they're very similar to, to um, gypsy moth, now called spongy moth egg masses, which they are about like an inch or so. So that's about the size and about the, the width. And this is what the, so the gypsy moth egg masses are here. And so this is kind of a better photo of kind of what they look like throughout the seasons. You can kind of, they do kind of bear some similarity to the Chinese mantis. Lichens are probably the yeah. most, the closest looking thing to them, especially if you're like from a distance. Hmm, that looks like an egg mass. And you get up there and you see that it's not. So yeah. that's the, the <coughs> similar thing to me. You will definitely see the wheel bugs too on bark, which can kind of, again, like out of the corner of your eye, kind of look like it. These guys are awesome though. So if you do see this, let them stay there. They are a confirmed predator of spotted lantern fly. Hmm. Ah. Hmm. So, yep. Yeah. So egg mass, you can see the little holes I was talking about right there. Mm -hmm. So that's what it looks like after they have hatched out. You'll see those little holes left behind. <coughs> the gypsy moths are pearls too, aren't they? Aren't they the ones that make those um, nests or webs? They let, they're like cotton webs in the branches of trees. Are those so yeah, so we moths? have eastern tent caterpillar, then we have fall webworm. So eastern tent caterpillar in spring, fall webworm in fall, especially on and they eat hickories, leaves. walnuts. And yep. then their nests or whatever they are, they fall down. I find them in the yard oh, the, yeah. when it yeah. gets colder. And generally, they're okay to have. You will have some birds that are tolerant of hairy caterpillars will go after them. So it's okay to leave those guys around. They're native, and they won't cause a lot of yeah. damage unless you have like a young fruit tree. You might want to just right. you know keep that protected. But mm -hmm. mature trees, you're not going to have issues mm -hmm. with. So spread, we kind of talked about this already. Pallets are a wonderful kind of protected source for them. So again, another way they probably spread from area to area, like we talked about adults. I mean, nymphs can be transported. They can definitely pop up in unexpected locations. A really interesting finding was from a young man. I think he was either in Illinois or Indiana. He submitted a insect box into his local 4-H ag 
fair and you happen to have a spot of lanterfly in there. So that was the confirmation because that young man found the, the bug and he brought us in and they were able to, to confirm that it made its way over there. So very interesting. And I think that was a couple states away from any known other population. <clears throat> so they are definitely making their way through kind of the US and on social media. So this is a beach in New York. These are all spotted lanternflies. Oh, wow. So it's just kind of a, an interesting view of what it, the infestation is looking like in different areas. Kind of the oh, New York City has them as well. So they are up in the buildings, kind of they like crawling to high places. So things like um, amusement parks, water slides, they'll crawl up and kind of be a nuisance in some of those areas too. So just. What would they do? Yeah. Why, why did they do the crawling up? Why are they on the beach? Oh, on the beach. Yeah. Doesn't look like there's any food source or anything. Right. That, it looks pretty barren, right? So probably what happened is they got caught in a wind current because they're such weak uh -huh. flyers. They're not like Emerald Ash Borer, for example, is a very strong flyer. It can fly, you know, 20 miles and it's a okay. Wow. But spotted lanternfly, they kind of flutter weakly. So if like a gust of wind caught them, you know, they probably just wash them out to sea. Well, it's just. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so these are all dead spots. These are dead. Yeah, these are dead. Yeah, they're not. Oh. You know, I'm looking for a food source. These are all deceased <laughs> spotted lanternfly. Is that them along the sand? Yep. Yeah. So this is all. Okay. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So just interesting, right? But yeah, you'll definitely find them. You know, in high populations on decks. So again, if you're bug adverse, it might not be the the happiest moment for you to go out and see <laughs> that sort of situation. So definitely, they are. They can be a nuisance in some of these circumstances. So there's been a lot of cute little <laughs> images <laughs> of them too. So this is kind of how the word's getting out there about them. I really like that one. <laughs> I like that little predator too. A little, a little predator. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 perfect. Yeah, you can try to control yeah. one of it. And there's been a lot of campaigns to kind of help to stop the spread. So yeah, Swisher is an app that's more kind of focused in the Pennsylvania area, but there's been a lot of other social media type stuff that's gone out. I think this was um, a Vice report where they talked about going into a public park and kind of getting rid of them. Yeah. So, but I think there's a lot to be said about just appreciating what's already out there and being very cautious that we're not just out there smushing spotted lanternfly at the expense of anything else. So that's kind of another another takeaway. You always want to consider that non-target effect that you're trampling sensitive habitat in order to go capture some spotted lanternfly that might not be the best management decision. So in Prince William County, we do have a way to report it. We do have the QR code here. This is the link. I do have that on some of the brochures back there. It's also available on online if you just go to pwcgov, or sorry, they changed the website, pwcba.gov slash SLF. That will take you to the reporting site as well. All right, so to reduce the spread, Again, proactively checking anything that you're transporting from any of these areas, and you, you all you all live, if not in a quarantined area, in an area where we know that spotted lanternfly is. So just double check all your material. That goes a long way to helping to reduce the spread, helping other locations to give them time to find more management strategies before it continues to spread. Avoid parking near Tree of Heaven. So like in your case for your property, mm -hmm. if you can kind of park away from them, mm -hmm. that's one way to reduce the likelihood of them laying eggs. Uh, remove managed Tree of Heaven. Again, very long-term process. Think carefully about what you want to do. That is very expensive to hire an arborist to come out and do that process. But kind of what Leopold's Preserve did is they did it in kind of stages a little bit. It wasn't like an all year thing. They would find populations and then they would start managing. That's also what Julie and me are doing over at Bristow Station Battlefield. So that definitely makes a difference. You don't have to do it all at once. Chipping wood is effective to destroy eggs. They've made kind of progress in that. So if you do know that you're taking a tree down, you don't want to leave it standing, you can go ahead and chip it. Use the mulch. It should kill those egg masses. And also report any findings as well, especially if you're outside of the areas where it's known. I think there's there's been so much media attention now. I think most people are familiar with it, so I think the reporting has gone way up. But it's still worthwhile to report any new populations you think you might. Yeah, even Front Royal and Warren County, they have a big <coughs> uh, campaign to, they have to, a big campaign to right educate now? the public, because I know they're there in Warren County as well. 
um, and we it's and it's quite prevalent around uh, Facebook and okay. social media okay. so trying to get the word out. Okay, that's, that's great. And I think few entries. that kind of wine country area, they're probably a little concerned about yeah, having to, yeah. to reduce that. Fauquier right. County has like 30 or 40 wineries. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. a very serious problem. Right. And it's definitely controllable. Like I promised Jimmy, we talked about there's definitely management strategies, but it, you know, it takes money. It takes time. You know, there are already profit margins to be considered, all those sorts of things. So it's definitely mm -hmm. doable, but it does take effort in order to do it. You're talking about a way to use more time and less money though. Of course, yes. I'm sure if um, the hack and squirt had a way to do that, they, they would share it, right? The hack and squirt method yes. is, is not as expensive, and yes. but you do have to have a license to purchase the triple gear for, or other. Uh, you, there, there, is, there are some that are used, right? Yeah, there are some triclopyr um, formulations available for homeowner use, but I would advise if you're not comfortable kind of doing those pesticide treatments to go ahead and hire a certified Virginia State certified pesticide applicator. But there are some formulations that are available for, for homeowner use. So a lot of the guys who just mow lawns and stuff and do property management have that certification now. They should, yeah. Anytime that you're that's that's who we use. Okay, it, it, it turned out to be not very expensive at all, really. We okay, just for, to do the hack. Did so a couple did. At a, a couple a week when he was mowing the lawn. He hop off his tractor and take care of a couple of trees. Okay, and no, that, that's great that it worked out. And then that when they die, you have it. to have somebody to cut he, them down. He, yeah, he'd take them down and, and uh, haul them off to chip them. Mm -hmm. That's great. So yeah, I mean, you can definitely give time for the pesticide to be translocated down to the roots if you're using mm -hmm. a systemic like that. A while, yeah. And then after the tree has died, yeah, as long as it's not too um, too risky for it to be removed, yeah, you can definitely hire a company to come back out. Well, the smaller ones you can off. just cut down yourself. And True. Yeah. Drill holes in the trunk and mm -hmm. squirt the triclopyr down in the holes. How long? How long does it take once you do the treatment? On, on average, a year or two, a couple of weeks or months. Or you said Julie said it died in a couple of weeks. Yeah, I, I think so. You'll you'll see the effects of it for within kind of the canopy within a couple of weeks. But I would still give it some time to be completely translocated yeah. down, and that's kind of why they recommend that you do it in fall, kind of early winter. You can do it almost any time of year, but they recommend you do it around that time because that's when all the, the sap the, flows down. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, they're kind of putting the reserves into the roots, and so that way you're getting the chemical into the roots. So I would probably give it to the following year to be safe. Yeah. If it's kind of in a risky location where it might fall and you, you want to be on the more cautious side, you could just go ahead and remove it and just wash for any sprouts. Because even if you treat it, you're still gonna get some sprouts coming up regardless. So just by you applying that pesticide, you should reduce the amount of sprouts that you're seeing come up. So that's a kind of use that rule of thumb when you're thinking about it. So you chip it and now can the chips are perfectly safe to use or is there some contamination in those chips that you're spreading around here? Mm -hmm. that, that's a good question. Mm, yeah. So it probably would take a little bit of time for the material to work its way out. I don't have yeah. an exact answer for you that's on that. I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure if I've seen that research. I don't know that. Doing it, yeah. I'd say if you take it you know, off to the landfill though, for it to be composted, that's gonna give it enough time to kind of work everything out. But since it's allelopathic in general, oh using it as chips may not be the best idea right away. I would give it some time to kind of have everything settle out. Depending on where you're using it. Just send it away, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't use it around any, like, uh, your grapes or around any plant you're growing to get Or streams. Or streams, yeah, that's a good, good, good point. Or anything sensitive that you don't want to get, the, get it around. So we were talking about what the business requirements are. So this is kind of what they would have to be filling out. And it's what you could fill out too as a homeowner if you want to be very, very cautious. And it kind of gives you all those different areas where you could expect to find egg masses or the other life stages. And it kind of tells you what to do should you find them. So on any shipment that's leaving Prince William County, they should be filling out this list, attaching it to the shipment, and then putting it out to where it needs to go. And that's their way of saying that they did indeed inspect it and they didn't find any evidence of the, the life stage. When you say shipment, yes. is that 
any shipments whatsoever. Technically. So like a pizza delivery guy, you know, goes. She's checking the pizza box. Oh my god! Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a business, right? I mean, pizza boxes there in, inside, but probably probably his car. Technically, he should be checking. It. Would they enforce that? Probably. They're probably the ones passing it around. <laughs> I mean, you, you think about all the different vehicles that go around Amazon delivery drivers. I mean, how many stops are those guys making every day? Well, that's how the Japanese silk grass. Has right. gotten her. Everybody's got them on the sides of their driveways. Right, yeah. right. And those mowers from, go from you know one yard yeah. to one yard. They clean yeah. it after every yard. They should be, but right. So the, you know, invasive species, we definitely help them out. I mean, that's right. how they're they're getting spread. So what we can do to reduce that spread <coughs> makes a big difference. Can I ask something? Yeah. Sure. Are you saying they're along the driveways? Yes. What? what? Silk grass. Japanese silk grass. Silk grass. Silk grass. Silk grass. Silk grass. Silk. 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 What so does it look like? Um, I think that you guys probably do have some here, and I unfortunately don't have a photo up, and I'm not sure if I have it, but if you look up Japanese silk grass silk invasive, grass. you should be able silk. to get it right silk. away. It, kind of, it looks like normal grass almost. It has a silvery mid-vein in the leaf, so that kind of distinguishes it from a lot of similar looking species. And it also has a seed head that kind of pops up around July to August time frame. And it grows really well in shady locations. So right. usually grass struggles and that kind of takes off. There are some in my woods. You'll see in your woods, woods yeah. Yeah. in the spring, it's beautiful green. Yeah, it's a beautiful green. There are some native grasses that will grow well in shaded locations too, like Lyrzea and uh, bottle brush grass. So you can see some native grasses in shadier locations, but um, Japanese silk grass kind of forms like a carpet almost, where it just spreads. It everything yeah. out. Everything. Yeah. But it looks pretty when it's mowed. It, it does, looks like grass. It does, but it does die off too in, in the it winter. It does die so off in the winter. Yeah, and then it always comes back. Right. It does, does it sort of have like long tentacles? Yes. And it looks brown where the grass was green. Yes. Yeah. Crap, that's what I got. My <laughs> we have the best lines form that, that I brought to. If you're interested, we can come out and do an evaluation for you. <laughs> Thank and you. Just, yeah, I, it is, it is very yeah. shallowly rooted. You can just I had an right area, out. and my neighbor, his driveway was next to me, mm -hmm. so we decided to work on it together. Okay, good. We killed all the grass, there you go. resawed it, yeah. and um, he moved away this spring, and I was helping my neighbor while she was away at breaking her leaves. Mm -hmm. His yard is nothing but tilt grass. Oh, really? So I thought, oh, well, that, that stinker, he had it all along. And <laughs> it just let it spread through your new side, huh? <laughs> but yeah, I definitely encourage the, the Best Lawns program, because we'll come out and identify any weeds that are on your property. Okay. Our Master Gardener volunteers for And it's so so stilt grass, starts with an S. Yes. yes. Stilt. Yes. Oh, I know. stilt. Yeah, if you're it's if you're steep. googling like it, like you're walking on stilts. Still. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and they call it that because it spreads like that. But I said it was still. Oh. It's still. Okay, thank you. Yes. All right. So ahead of the invasion, so what you can do definitely keep your other plants healthy. So if you haven't seen spotted lanternfly or you only have a couple so far, keeping everything healthy goes a long way to preventing any issues with with your current landscaping plants. Make sure you're doing right plant right place kind of planting strategies. Make sure your plants are happy where, where you're putting them in. If it needs full sun, like say crepe myrtle, make sure you're putting it in full sun. Not native. Not native, not native, <laughs> you're right, not native. But that's just, let's see, what's a good native alternative? Service berry. Service berry, so partial shade, park sun conditions. Yeah. So yeah, you don't want to put it all right out where it's getting full beat or down dog sun. dogwood, red bud. True, very, yeah, very good options. So plant nova natives also is a good good option to take a look at natives that you can plant as well as kind of give you guidance to what may work well on your property. Manage invasive plants like the Japanese silk grass, like Olanthus, can be helpful. So I don't think that um, it necessarily feeds on silk grass, but it definitely feeds on Olanthus. It will also um, lay its eggs at least on autumn olive, Russian olive. So doing some of that invasive species management can certainly help. Make sure your water is still trees underground, and, though they'll be coming up forever. Make sure you're watering your trees and shrubs deeply as needed. That is also very helpful when we have those long periods, month or so without rain, that can go a long way to making sure that your trees and shrubs stay healthy, especially if they're newly establishing. So some things you want to avoid, <laughs> and I may not have to tell this group this, but just in case, 
So you do not want to be doing this pruning, so to speak, of your trees. You're killing your tree by doing that. If you're concerned about pruning, definitely hire a certified arborist or a tree care industry association agency to come out and do an evaluation for you. You want to avoid volcano mulching. This is also killing your tree. Think about the root system. If you are tilling or digging up right next to your tree, that is going to make it extremely unhappy. It can also have other things. This looks like it's an elm. So it might have something else going on that's not necessarily related to spotted land of the black. So predators, we're talking about birds. Yes, they will go after spotted lantern flies. So that's a beautiful shot. So we're also the wheel bugs will also definitely go after spotted lantern fly praying mantises. There's a lot out there. Spiders, I've seen them in spider webs. Oh, good. So 100%, there are things out there that can help to manage them. Again, they are not going to eradicate them, but they will help to keep that population down. So once you know that you have it on your property, so integrated pest management principles, make sure you have 100% ID'd it as spotted lanternfly. You can always reach out to Virginia Cooperative Extension. We are very, very glad our horticultural help desk to make sure that you know what you are handling. You do want to monitor activity. If you just have a couple on your property, it's, you know, it, it really, it's not going to do anything for you to chase them all, all down, really. I mean, your, your trees and your shrubs can handle a little bit of that feeding pressure. It's not going to be that much of a concern. Determine the threshold for action. Evaluate available treatment options or cultural control. Again, always considering non-target effects and what you may be impacting. Assess your treatment and continue monitoring. Once you do that application, it's not sit back and relax. You do want to continue to monitor the situation and see what else potentially that you could do. So this is a very extreme example. This was an early photo from Pennsylvania. So hypothetically, if you have a high population, that's what you're gonna be dealing with. This tree is already stressed. You can see the sawdust. That's not caused by spotted lanternfly. It probably has some termite damage going in in that kind of crevice in the trunk. So this is what the traps look like when it is full. So there are plenty of live guys in there. Some of them have died off. So again, that's what you have to think about dealing with if you're trapping. So you're, you know you're seeing this level of population. You don't need to do anything at that point. You're seeing this level of population. You're concerned about the tree, even though they are saying that it is only stressing the tree out because this tree is tree is already clearly stressed. You have kids kind of play areas around it. You're getting all the UV mold. Mm -hmm. Hypothetically, you may want to go ahead and think about treatment in that situation, but you don't have to. I would. What? What's treat? We We're almost there. Okay. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so, I like to have some dead spotted lanternflies. Okay, I, we, I can provide you some dead spotted okay. lanternflies. I, I have uh, free range guineas. Okay, well, all right. So, and if I anyone like has them, a high population, in there to see if they go okay. I think they I should. I believe they have found that chickens will will go or mm -hmm. guineas will will go oh, for yeah. them. So, yeah. I think it should be a nice food source for them. So when they're young, that early nip stage, when they're black and white, they're only going to be feeding for a very short period. They're not doing a lot of damage because they're not sucking up as much sap as they will when they get a little bit older. So you might see some wilting, like things feeding on basil and some of those ornamental plants. You might see a little bit of wilting at that point. You know, you could rip the plant out, smash them. You could do a contact insecticide if it's something you're really concerned about, if you're comfortable applying that to your ornamental plants or plants that you're using as a food source. Again, you always want to follow the label 100%. The label is the law. We always have to put that out there when we're talking about pesticides. You can always contact Virginia Cooperative Extension if you're not sure what you need to be using. But when they're in that early stage, generally the contact insecticides, if you want to use pesticides, that is your best option and it won't affect as much as potentially doing the systemic pesticide. But generally, <coughs> excuse me, when they're that young, you don't really need to apply pesticides because they're only going to be there a week or two, they'll move on to something else. So frequent monitoring is needed as for adults as well because they will really hop around. They're not going to stay on one tree generally. They'll continue to move around so they feed on that, that range of food sources. Like we talked about, complete eradication is not going to happen at this point in our area. And on your property, it's, again, not going to happen just because there's so many other sources for them to come, come in on. 
So management options, now I will talk about the management, but this is what I'll be referencing. This guide from Penn State, this is what I would recommend you guys take a look at. The Virginia Cooperative Extension documents, they also may reference this guide. So this is kind of the definitive guide right now, in my opinion, in the US to, to management options for spotted land or fly. So considerations, how many SLF are present? That's probably kind of number one, one thing to think about, as well as what do you have on your property that may attract them. So if you have a low population, few SLF favorite plants, all those we talked about, maples, willow, birch, tree of heaven, it's a low risk. You probably don't want to be applying any pesticides. Once we get to a higher population, so heavy levels of adult and nymph feeding, excessive amounts of sooty mold, then kind of that propensity for management may increase in your opinion. So say you have many SLF favorite plants, maples, willow, et cetera, then you, know, you may want to start considering management at that point. If your plants are under stress, then maybe a slightly smaller population may encourage you to go ahead and take action. Or if you have proximity to vulnerable plants, such as young plants, newly established plants, vineyards in particular, then you are at higher risk to see some potential adverse impacts from spotted lanternfly. Does that all make sense in terms of that kind of reasoning process? So what sort of control should you use? So now that you know kind of what you're dealing with on your own property, what are those next steps? You always want to start with cultural control. So like we talked about, making sure your, your plants are healthy, they're planted in the right place. Hopefully you're using natives because they're better adapted to our environment and not the crepe myrtles, so that will be helpful. <laughs> so don't assume all damage is from SLF. Remember, we have a wide range of insects, a wide range of other plants and diseases that may be impacting. So make sure that identification is positive. Again, reach out to us if you have any questions. So do cultural control first. Physical mechanical control. We tested this out at Leopold's Preserve. Vacuuming works. It is actually effective to get them up. So if you're seeing a couple of adults, you're like, you know, I'm really concerned about this tree. I don't want to have that extra stress. Take out your handheld vacuum, suck them up, kill them. That was effective. We tested it. So I heard that, um, that uh, technique. <laughs> yes, yes. Bug assault, assault gun, that's something yeah. else that people use. I'd be careful about using that in the garden, but you know, if you're kind of out and you know, on your driveway or something like that, it might be okay. But yeah, there are definitely physical, mechanical things you can do. A fly swatter also works, kind of ushering them into a filled bottle with water and soap. That is also effective. So there are definitely steps you can take without going to pesticides. Biological control is also super important. Making sure you have natives on your property, your black walnuts, et cetera, mm -hmm. that are gonna be supporting a wide range of insects, birds, spiders, et cetera, that can help to reduce the population is incredibly important. So if we all took that step, then maybe we would see a lot less. So if you have to move into chemicals, you have a tree or plant you're really concerned about, you're starting to see a high population, maybe you're starting to see that massive population on your deck and you wanna go out and enjoy your deck you don't want to have to vacuum every day. Maybe you want to go ahead and think about that chemical control. So starting with the least toxic options first. So insecticidal soaps, that's a contact pesticide. Again, it's going to be more effective on the nymphs when you first start to see them, but it will also work on, on the adults too. Neem and botanical oils, pyrethrum, they have very little residual activity. I would caution pyrethrum while it is a natural component, it will affect other non-targets pretty severely. So that's, to me, that's kind of up there into the chemical control, but just make sure you read the label and you understand what you're putting down before you decide to do it. So moving up into the higher reaches of chemical control, using the other contact pesticides, so Zeta, Cypermethrin, Bifepharin, Carbile, the dinotephrin, imidacloprid, those are the systemic pesticides. So that's when you call your pesticide applicator to come out, make the hole, and then kind of make the hole into the trunk, kind of like they did for the tree of heaven treatments, and then it's incorporated throughout the tree. So anytime something feeds on the tree, it's going to die. So that is one way. In some ways, that does reduce the risk to non targets because it's only what's feeding on the tree. We know that Alanthus is non native. If we're making these pesticide applications to Olympus to reduce the overall population in the area, you're going to affect a lot less non-targets just because they are not focusing on Olympus. 
The one caveat to that is during bloom, I think it's the next slide, this is what it looks like when it's blooming. It has really tiny flowers, for, especially for the male. You want to avoid during bloom because you will get insects attracted to those blooms. So to make sure you're not impacting those pollinators, I would highly, highly encourage you to do after bloom. And so that's going to be around the summer time frame because they'll bloom like around June-ish or so. When do the eggs hatch? The eggs will hatch around April. But it kind of depends if we have a non-winter kind of like what we had last year, it will they will hatch a little earlier. Mm. So definitely think about all those non-target pests when we're doing that. For vineyards, another thing that they found works well is just um, barriers. So they'll put netting up around the plants. It, you know, it is labor intensive, but you don't have to apply the same amount of pesticides. So putting kind of a mesh netting up to where the larger nymphs and adults can't get in to attack them, that is a perfectly legitimate way of protecting your plants. So make sure you understand that label completely. Make sure you understand what personal protective equipment is needed if you go the pesticide route. Be very mindful of pollinators. Be mindful of aquatic risk or any other sensitive habitats. Remember, pesticides can drift. So if you're applying it on a windy day, make sure you read that pesticide label to make sure to see what those wind speed requirements are. Some things will say apply when there's no wind. So you have to follow that if that's what the label says. Also have a spill kit ready. So if you do accidentally spill a little bit, if you're doing that application yourself, definitely have something ready to clean it up so you're minimizing the, the risk to other organisms in the area. And again, you can always hire a pesticide, state certified pesticide applicator to do the process for you. So what do you do if you see spotted lanternfly? Verify ID. Capture if you can. This is kind of older information, but again, if you feel a little bit uncertain that you do have spotted lanternfly, this can be useful just to start the process. Capture it, send a photo in to either us or uh, Prince William County Mosquito and Forest Pest Management. You can vacuum adult snips into soapy water. You start to see them. Scrape egg masses like we talked about. Double bag it. Put it into the hand sanitizer rubbing alco alcohol. Throw it away. Pesticides, kind of going through that integrated pesticide pest management process. Remember label directions and remember to kind of use that consideration process. What are my plants? How many spotted lanternfly am I seeing? How stressed are my plants? What is my threshold to make that action to reduce the population? And that is the rundown on spotted minor fly. So I'm glad to answer any other questions that you all may have. This is our MG help desk. You are very welcome to send any photos, any questions into us. Susie is one of our help desk regulars. Don't you work for the I have, yeah. I have one. Jimmy has helped out in the past, but we have very, very experienced and wonderful Master Gardener volunteers who help us to answer these questions, and they'll send it on up the chain to us. We have had a lot of, uh, I guess, a lot of sightings this fall. Yeah, yeah, we definitely have Most had a lot of calls we've had been about that since, yeah. like, the middle of September. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, I wonder if bats eat them. Ooh, that's a good question. But don't they, don't they, they travel down the tree? Is there something about them coming down the tree and then going back up the tree, which is why the trap is effective? Exactly. So they do do that, but they will fly, especially kind of during that period, like right after they mate, to kind of go and lay the egg masses. So yeah, I would expect that bats would go after them during that time. I don't know if it's been confirmed that bats indeed do eat them, but I would suspect mm -hmm. they probably do. I do have a black suit around my black walnut trees on the ground. Um, it's like mashed black walnuts. What causes that? Um, I mean, there are animals that will eat black walnuts, particularly squirrels is kind of the number one I see. And then as they break down, they will right. kind of... Bit. It's like a mash, a black yeah. mash of black walnuts, and it's around the circumference of the tree trunk on the ground. So you probably have very healthy black walnuts that are producing yeah. kind of a high yeah, just nut black loads. walnuts on the ground. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and they are allelopathic as well, so just like... Um, it's like a pile, and yeah. it's they're yeah. mashed. And it's just around the tree trunk. And then I see the black walnuts here and there, of course, on the ground. This is like a mashed area that's around the tree trunk. By uh, mashed, you mean pressed into the ground? I, I don't know what you mean by No, that. it's it's like above the ground, and it's just, um, I, I see harsh, harsh parts of um, squished black walnuts, and it's it's like a paste, but it's around the tree trunk. Uh -huh. 
So they're probably just leaving like little remnants of the nut and it's just kind of getting pushed down. Yeah. I, I wouldn't be, it's, it's interesting, natural mulch, I think of it that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Like organic, yeah. yeah. All right, it's a pleasure to speak with you all. Thank, thank you for you. coming out here. Thank you. Thank you. I do have some eval forms in the back if you don't